morning, everybody. You know, I love that song so much because I cannot help but see God chasing us down with God's own goodness. I just have this image of running and, and God chasing us with goodness and just, just, just running as fast as God can with goodness. And you know, I woke up this morning and I thought of our gratitude journals. How many people are still keeping those gratitude journals? Aren't they so wonderful? So I wanted to open up this morning and it goes so with this song. By the way, in case you don't know me, I'm Pastor Tracy. And in case you don't know where you are, you're in Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. And in case you need to know, our purpose statement is loving God and loving others fearlessly. Just wanted to remind everybody. Okay, now I'll keep going. But it's such a good song because God's goodness, God's goodness is always running after us. So what I want to ask you all to join me in this morning as we, we move into the call to worship is what are you grateful for? Help me with the call to worship this morning and just call out to me, what are you grateful for this morning? His mercy, sunshine, hello, yes. Warmth, 73 degrees today, hallelujah. What else? What did you say? Life, yes. What else? Answers to prayer, yes. What else? God's provision. Getting the best dog cuddles, yes. Yes. Connection. What What did you say? Uh, thankful for a wonderful husband that puts up with her. Amen, David. We appreciate you too, David. I could, if Tony were here, he'd be saying amen. What else? Catching up with old friends, yes. Safe travels, yes. Good health, yes. Coffee, yeah, absolutely. This community, yes, amen. What else? Couple more. What? Human alarm clocks, yes. Are you holding her right now? Yes, that's what we thought. Music, yes. Cinnamon rolls, yeah. Yeah, is that a hint, John? Maybe a little hint we got going on or something like that? How about our worship team, yeah? Yeah. So let's all stand this morning. Oh, what did you say, Sarah? Jesus, what a great segue into worship, yes. I got to get a high five for that one. Come on. Beautiful. Thank you. It's all she wrote. I'm going to leave it right with what Sarah said. Jesus, let's worship church. All right. Here we go.
Beautiful, sang that song today. Beautiful. Now you're all tired. Look, look, we're still standing up here, so, yeah. Sing it. <laughs> Woo. You know, I had a chance to uh, watch The Path of Totality on Monday for the solar eclipse. And I, I was watching it, and then I would go outside and look to see if it was here yet, and, you know, saw the little strip, and it was really cool. But what was amazing to me was the people that saw the total eclipse, just, they were just broken. They were just, they had, they just lost their minds. They're just like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. They were screaming with joy. And they're going, there's something bigger than us. And they, they were screaming at each other, like, this is so beautiful. We're not alone. And I was just sitting there going, yeah. Like every Sunday I get that. You know, I don't need an eclipse, but like, good for you that you see that. And it was like, it brings us together. It's just this amazing. I'll go, that's Jesus. I'm screaming at the TV. I'm like, kind of inspired me for my set this morning. Because to hear people worship God and they don't even know they're worshiping, like, that's how we were created. We were created to, to love and worship God. And when they tap into that, when we tap into that, you can't help but cry and weep for joy and be overwhelmed. They were completely overwhelmed. Newscasters couldn't speak. It's amazing. You look it up on, on YouTube, some of the reactions. And I say all that, and then Friday night I'm driving up 202, and I look out in the distance, kind of north of Norristown, and there's a squatty little fat piece of a rainbow peeking through the bottom of the clouds. It's the fattest rainbow I've ever seen. It was so pretty and so big, but it was only like this big. It was just peeking out. And I just went, promises over Norristown. <laughs> you know, I was just like, Jesus, you're just showing up. Like, you're just showing us you're here. Like, these are just small things, but we get to have him every day. We get to feel and know the love and the amazement of God every single day. And I'm just so thankful for that. And I love that we started with gratitude today because that's how my heart feels just in the few things this week of seeing God's splendor. And, you know, you think about the Psalms and how David was just overwhelmed with the glory of God and the beauty of God. And uh, I'm just so thankful that we get to do that here. We get to see God in his beauty and in his mercy every single week. And so, God, we just thank you for who you are. Thank you for all the beautiful gratitude this morning that opened our hearts up to see you, to sing praise to you, to know that you love us, that you see us, that you care for us, that, yeah, there's something bigger, and it's you, God. It's you and your love and your care and your watch care over us. We just give in to that today. We just see you, God. We see who you are today. Thank you, Jesus.
we'll sing that second verse. The universe is at your
Vamos, sing it. wonder when I look at the things that God has done and as the song says uh, indicates when I look at the sky whether it's day or night there's opportunities for me to be filled with wonder whether it's because of all the stars when I slow down and take a look that takes my breath away. Or whether it's in the day, whether it is sunny when the sky is so blue. Or even when it's cloudy and lightning strikes. There are moments when you have to look around and say, what could have created such beauty and magnificent power? What? Because as Johnny was saying about the eclipse, there are moments in our life that we slow down and observe the little subtleties that make us start to think there has to be something greater than me. There's evidence all around us. And you start to also wonder is can I have that great power somehow one day work for me? The same power that put the stars in the sky or that makes the lightning so vibrant. Could that power also work for me? And then the other part of we're singing about today of amazement, or like the old people that I grew up used to say, I am amazed one more again. <laughs> one more again. When I think about that power loving me. One more again. That's why we pray. And are amazed when we think about our God. Man, I'm going to have my servants come and join me. And I'm also have my wife come in and take a look at her. <laughs> Don't look too close. That's mine and I'm territorial. <laughs> trying to think where we should put it um so uh, we'll just do it so faith had a word um thank you service for being patient um so today a lot of people are um working through healing right we have some colds and some flu and some 
various infections. Um, and so Faith had a word just about our health and, and, and breath. So we'll have her share. Hi. <laughs> this is a little outside my comfort zone, so bear with me. <laughs> um, I've recently been struggling really badly with my own health. And I know that a lot of people within our community that I know are also struggling with their health um, and their physical bodies and coming to healing um, within this time. And I was just thinking that as we worshiped and we uh, sang about with our breath and even with just one breath, we can still praise the Lord. And I was just thinking that as our bodies shift and grow and heal and get sick over time, we can always count on having our breath. And even if we can't count on our body physically working, our legs working, our arms working, our organs working, we can still count on the fact that even just one breath, we can praise the Lord. And I think sometimes it's easy when you're feeling ill or um, losing function to feel overwhelmed by the fact that you're un like not capable of doing something, but you are still capable of one breath. And if you think that you're not doing enough because you're stuck on the couch or stuck in bed or stuck in a hospital, you're doing enough as long as you're just taking one breath. Every second you take a new breath and with that breath you praise the Lord. And sometimes when I'm struggling with my health, I like to think in the good moments um, just to center myself and close my eyes. And I just wanted to do that with you guys here today. So if everyone can just center themselves, close their eyes and get a little bit grounded. I like to start from my toes and um, just be thankful for each part of my body and thank God for each part of my body. So if in this moment we can just be thankful for those of you whose feet are working today, just be thankful for your feet and be thankful for your legs and your knees that work and your hips and your bones that work and your internal organs and your stomach and your digestive system that work today and your strong shoulders and back that carry the load every day and your arms that help you function and do your day-to-day -day tasks and the intricate muscles in our hands that help us carry and grasp and hold and our neck that holds up our head and our mind that keeps us centered and grounded and helps us think and produce and move forward and our face that allows us to give expression and comfort one another with our emotions. I encourage everyone to thank God for what they're capable of today because we have others in our community who are not capable of those things right now. So as you take a deep breath in, remember that what you're capable of is a gift and to spread it within our community today. And every day, praise God with the breaths that you have. Amen. Thank you, Faith. Amen. It's a blessing, right? Whatever we have, wherever we are, we have our breath. And with our breath, we can praise the Lord. And so we don't have to focus on what's wrong. We can thank God for healing in our bodies every moment, every hour. But we can focus and praise God because of the breath that we have and the things that we can do and we can embrace where we are. Amen. Thank you for that word. And we're just going to transition in here. So take another breath. Thank you, God, for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And I hope that the people were able to grasp as faith was talking through all the different things that work together in our bodies to create motion and progress and sustainability within our bodies, the complexity of it all, that we also grasp that it's given to us by you. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for the ability to use it for your kingdom and for the purpose that you have for us in our life. Amen? Amen. Now, I'd ask for all of you to prepare your hearts and mind for the next part of our praise and worship, and that is our tithes and offering. 
If you are in agreement, if you appreciate the things that we do in terms of trying to reach out to people, to let people know about a God that cares for them, that loves them, that is amazing, wonderful, outstanding, I ask that you join with us in our ministry. So as we continue to do the video, the podcast, the the website, and the study, all to bring something to people that God has in this hour. And what I mean by this hour is this time in our country, this time in life that matches this time in life. That helps us to grow and to be what God has asked us to be. And that is a shining light up on the hill. And that as we lift up God, that God will draw into them. Amen. So I ask, uh, there are many different ways to give that will be on the screen. But let me pray for you first. Dear God, we thank you for the openness and the diligence of your people. For what they have to give. And I ask that you bless it. And give us the wisdom to use it in the appropriate ways that we would continue to glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, there, there, there are times when I wish you all could stand here and see you. And what do I see in you today? I see some good-looking people. I, what did you all do this weekend? Because y'all look good. Y'all smiling. Y'all, y'all, y'all fairly attentive. Uh, whatever you did on Friday and Saturday, do that again. Do that again. Whatever that was, you, you, you look fairly stress-free. Is that the truth or you just acting? Some of y'all just acting? Okay, all right, all right. Well, we're going to turn loose the children so they can go. Uh, Rashida and Tassida in the back. Uh, and the youth are going as well. Let's pray for them as they go. Dear God, we thank you for our children. We ask that you bless them. And open up their ears to hear what you have for them in this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So y'all must have changed up the schedule because y'all usually send out the youth when I'm speaking. I don't know what that's about. But uh, uh, yeah, Pastor T switched things up on you. uh, Yes? Oh. There's another James. I thought you were being yelled at. (laughs) Answer. You were being yelled at. You're like, what? I got issues. So, y'all give the praise and worship team another hand. Thank you for what you do and how you usher us in and soothe us and help us to uh, go forward and worship. My last task of today is to introduce uh, to, to you our speaker, Brother Kevin. What do I say about Kevin? He's a good guy. I'll start there. He's a guy that loves his family, loves his children. Concerned about you and always thinking about you and how the different ways of the diversity of people may come into our body and view what we do differently. And how is the discussion? Do we then show to you our care for you? That's Kevin. 
He's always concerned about how do we show care for you. We miss it from time to time, but it's not for a lack of concern. So that concern, I hope that you hear as Kevin comes and speaks to you today about what God has shared with him to share with you. Let's welcome Good morning. Uh, it is such a good morning. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. I am so excited about the text that I have for today. Uh, I was sharing with the elders at prayer before service. My prophetic hope for this morning is that we would all be like in a color run. Have you guys seen a color run? Like, it's like a race, like a 5K, and, you know, some of you are excited about that. Most of us are not. But the, the part of a color run is a lot of people just do it, like, for fun because there are people on the sidelines throwing, like, this dyed cornstarch pouches, and it hits you in, like, bursts. Like, and the pictures are always, like, really dynamic. You know, bright magenta and bright orange and bright cyan and all these really vibrant colors. And at the end of the race, you know, the people are covered in this colorful dust, they're covered in the remnant of that. And that is my prayer for this morning. I've prayed that that would be the way we would experience and enter into worship this morning, that the praise and worship, like, so we're all the ones, all of us. We're not on the sidelines. Don't get the picture reversed. You're not the ones throwing color at me. We're all in the race. We're, we're in the tunnel. We're all the ones racing the race. And the worship and the sermon, and the scripture, those are the things that are interacting with us. That's the spirit of God interacting with us and leaving its vibrant, colorful dust on us. And so my prayer is that by the end of this service, you'd be looking just like those people at the end of the race and like taking pictures and all smiles and yeah, they're sweaty, but they're also covered in like all these colors from all of the experience, things they've experienced together in that time. I just really pray for that this morning. So, I mean, I pray you'd enter in with me. Come along with me. Come into this text with me. I am so excited to share it with you. I hope some of that rubs off on you like dust. I have so much to share that I'm fighting the urge to, like, just rush right into it. Like, no introduction, just, like, jump right into the text because it is so rich to me that I could go on for hours. But I wanted to just take a minute to say, but the interpretation of Scripture itself is such a rich gift. I have one verse today, but I could talk about it with you for hours. Now, if I were to restrict myself to just the text alone, I could share it with you in under eight seconds. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. I just did it. But just as an obituary can't adequately capture the whole life of a person lived, so a scripture without interpretation cannot adequately capture the fullness of an infinite God. It is an endlessly unfolding revelation. I mean, how many of us have read a verse at one point in our life and been deeply impacted by it, but then read or heard that same verse or verses years later, months later, years later, decades later, but then been deeply impacted by it again, but in an entirely new way. And why is that? Well, in part, it's because we experience the text in the context of our experiences. And anyone alive knows the only constant in life is change. Our experiences are constantly changing with each new moment and added to the experiences themselves are perceptions of our experiences and our reactions to those perceptions all shape and reshape and reshape the way that we show up and move through the world. To put it simply, we grow, hopefully. We learn new things. Even on a cellular level, we are in a constant state of change, of being remade, made anew. And this undeniable experience of life can't help but shade the way that we interpret everything. Your experience and your relationship with the church shades how you show up in this room today, whether it is in alignment with, the church, with your past experiences or in complete rebellious opposition to your experiences that you may have grown up with. Your relationship with me shades how comfortable or uncomfortable you are right now. 
And your relationship with my previous sermons informs either how excited and open you are or how closed and guarded you are to hearing this one. And I'm not here to condemn any of that. Your experience is your own. And I hope that you know, as James said, I do love you and I do love God. And I love this place and I earnestly seek after truth. And those are my sincere intentions that I do come to this sermon with. But I too bring my life and my experiences to this. And I openly acknowledge that. And as a church, we openly acknowledge that. That's one reason that we embrace a centered set theology. We, we come from all 360 degrees around this circle, this central idea of Jesus Christ and his example of what it means to love God and love the world back to wholeness. The love of redemption, relationship, and reintegration. We were created from this place of love and are called to this place of love, but our journeys to pursue it are as varied as we are. Everyone's path is different. And at Cornerstone, we acknowledge and we honor your path, your journey, to encourage you to continue your pursuit of that love of Jesus. So yeah, I'm really excited to share my experience this morning with this text, and I encourage you to allow this to be just the beginning, just an entry point into your own experience with this text this week. I do hope I challenge you to think about it in new ways. I do hope that you are stirred by it. And uh, I'm not here as an expert, but as a fellow co-journer. So I accept the grace with which you give me. So with all of that high context preface made, let's dive in. I invite you to settle into your seat in whatever way you'd like. You can lay back. You can sit on the edge of your seat. Just let the words wash over you as you take a little Sunday morning snooze or journal your little hearts out. You do you, I'll do me. So Hebrews 11, this chapter that we're in, this chapter we've been journeying with and looking at, and the way that they look back to look, to inform their present, to look forward about how they're going to live their presence. So looking back at all these people who lived and the way that they lived with a hope that lived, looked beyond what they were living and the way that that informs our now. So that's where we're at, Hebrews 11, this faith, the hall of faith, the faith of Abel, Enoch, Noah, the faith of Abraham, Sarai, Isaac, and then today, the faith of Jacob, also called Israel. And because it only takes seven seconds, here it is again, Hebrews 11, 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. And again, I'm going to do me. So that means it's time for Greek Grammar School, a crash course for Christians. <laughs> Pistis Jacob Apathnesco. Pistis Jacob Apathnesco. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying. And that last word, Apothnesco is actually two Greek words. It's a compound word. Apo, meaning from, of, or near, and thnesco, meaning dead, like all the way. So Jacob has lived 147 years and is now very near, close to, being all the way dead. And this is the moment that he performs this act of faith for which the author of Hebrew commends him, which for one shows... It's never too late to do something meaningful. <laughs> you can be at death's door and still do that meaningful thing. And two, it's worth noting, he's not listed for the faith of working a second seven years after being deceived in order to win the love of his life. He's not listed for the faith of fathering the 12 tribes of Israel, not the faith of wrestling with God and receiving a new name, Israel, a name that then becomes the name of the entire Hebrew nation. But this moment, which piques the interest, by faith, as Jacob rounded third base and is going in for the slide at home plate of life, he blessed both the sons of Joseph. This was his great act of faith, which at first is a little puzzling. I mean, wrestling with God or an angel and holding your own sounds pretty epic. 
as does fulfilling the prophecy to become the father of an entire nation, a name that endures millennia later. But this is the one, at least for the author of Hebrews. And while my etymological study didn't shed any light on the why of that, and why this author chose this moment, something else did emerge for me in this etymological study. So the Greek word that's next, the Greek word for blessed, is eulageo. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, eulageo. And maybe like me, you're thinking, huh, that word looks like eulogy. And we'd be right. It is. Uh, it is the Greek word eulageo is the etymological root for the modern day word eulogy. And what is a eulogy? Well, technically it means praise or bless. But we all understand or interpret it to mean blessings or high praise spoken over someone dead about their life about the kind of person they were and the things that they have accomplished in the past. And yet, here, the eulogy is being given by Jacob as he was dying. The eulogy is being given by the one dying over the ones living. And before they had accomplished anything, anything other than being who they were, just being his children. Doesn't that preach? And in this revelation, I hear the invitation to speak my eulogies over people while they're still alive, to give them their flowers while they're yet living, and to bless them not for what they have done or will do for me, but simply and purely for being. Just being who you are. And this beautiful, symbolic meaning doesn't stop there. Like I said, seven second verse, but I could go on for hours. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Jacob eulogized each of the sons of Joseph. He blessed them both. But I'm going to ask you to put a pin in that one for now, with the promise that we will circle back to that particular part later. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. On the surface, two very simple phrases. Tagons, really. I mean, if you were reading the whole chapter of Hebrews in a single clip, I doubt we would, any of us, even notice those words. But taken alone, leaning upon the top of his staff. Why might the author of Hebrews include this seemingly obscure detail? Well, what do we know about Jacob and the way that he walked? Yeah, he walked with a limp. According to the account in Genesis 32, this was a souvenir from when he wrestled with God and refused to let go without receiving a blessing. And he walked away with a limp and a new name, Yisrael, which means God perseveres. And the other seemingly simple phrase here, and worshipped. I mean, it's, it's even shorter and even easier to gloss right over. But what if we didn't? What if we pause right here and consider Jacob in this moment worshipping? The obvious question being, why? Well, let's remember together. Yes, he may have been eulogizing his grandsons in this verse, but in these last few words of our verse for today, I hear an invitation for us to remember Jacob, a eulogy for Jacob, if you will. As he lay dying, Joseph came to his father's bedside with his two sons, and Jacob worshipped. Take a moment and allow yourself to wonder. Why do you think this particular scene prompted Jacob to worship? And then let's remember this together. Let's remember, Jacob worked for seven years for the love of his life, only to be tricked and to have to work another seven years for her. Then after all of that waiting, they wait some more as Leah bears 
Reuben, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah. Rachel waits. Childless. So she offers her servant Billa as she watches Billa then bear Dan and Naphtali. And then watches again as Leah offers her servant Zippa and Zippa bears Gad and Asher. Only for Leah to come out of retirement herself and have a little reunion tour again, bearing Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah, a girl after six boys. All as Rachel watched. All as Rachel waited. That's a lot of waiting. That's a lot of wanting to only ever be watching for Rachel. Have you ever loved someone who's experiencing infertility? It's a rough journey. It's a deep hurting. I think it can be one of the deepest hurtings of the human existence. I know it has been for those I've loved that have walked that path. Feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, month after month, year after year, all the while seeing the things you want most happening for feel like everyone around you, just not happening for you. I can't imagine Rachel's pain. She watched her sister that she already shares with her husband bear six sons and a daughter in her house. I know secondhand the pain others see when they're wanting to be pregnant themselves but are not. And I mean, they get deep pain even seeing someone pregnant at a grocery store or on Facebook. Now imagine holding that deep desire and watching your sister bear children with your husband in your house. You can't even escape it. And then to watch even as their servants bear two sons each. All the while, she remains loved, but barren. Can we take a moment and join Rachel there in her grief? Can we wait a second? And while I trust that Jacob was excited about the addition of every single new life that came into his family, because I am sure he was. As a father myself, I know the deep love I hold for every one of my children. But as someone who also loved another so much as to work 14 years to be united with them, it would be hard for me to imagine that he didn't also feel for Rachel in her grief and her pain, even alongside his own joy. And then, after all those years of waiting all those years of watching it happen for everyone else, Rachel has Joseph. They literally name him Increase. God shall add. Because of how much joy and relief and release his birth added to their lives. But this joy was short-lived. As Rachel went on to bear another son, Benjamin, But in bringing his life into the world, her life exited as she died in childbirth. She barely got to experience that thing that she had desired and wanted for so long. But our love doesn't die with our loved ones. You can see that heart still up there that was inside that stick figure. Rachel is not there, but their love still is. Again, one of my favorite Marvel quotes, what is grief if not love persevering? But where does it go? Well, take all of that love, all of that longing that would make a man work and wait for 14 years to be married to the woman that he loves and deposit it into Joseph. And we all know what happened from there. This great love Jacob had for Joseph was more than his brothers could bear. They sold him into slavery in Egypt and told their father that he was dead. It's believed that Joseph was 17 years old. How deep a loss. It's hard for me to grasp the gravity of grief for Jacob. In part, it's hard for any of us to really get there because we all know this story from the outside. 
Like, we all know Joseph wasn't really dead. But we're journeying with Jacob today. So put yourselves in the shoes of Jacob. He's just been told that the son, that's one of the few remnants he has of the woman, his deep love of his life, that they waited so long to have, and is now one of the few things he has left, has now joined the one he loves in death. It's also hard for us to do this because we, we know that Joseph is alive and we even write off the years of slavery and imprisonment because we know the ending from the palace. We know the ending in the palace from the beginning at the betrayal. But for Jacob, this long-awaited son of his long-awaited love just joined Rachel in death, at least as he is living this experience. And we all know the story from there. Slave, prison, palace, second in command to Pharaoh himself, Fast forward to famine, drought, and desperation, which bring Joseph's brothers from Canaan to Egypt. So they come from Canaan. They arrive in Egypt to beg for food, the one place that still has food, some 20 years later, two decades later. A reunion that they could not see, for Joseph had been dead so long in their own memories, they could not even see him living here in front of him. A trick and a test And then a repentance observed by one becomes a reunion made visible to them all. Which leads to Jacob coming to Egypt to be reunited with Joseph. Back from the dead. I can't fathom the dividends of hope that must have been restored and deposited back into Jacob's heart on that day. So yes, Jacob worshipped. He worshipped that Joseph was there alive in front of them, that he was still alive to see Joseph alive, and then to see the lives of Joseph's children, Manasseh and Ephraim, branches of a generational tree that he had believed had been cut off, here alive and budding. Let's look back at our source text for today, which is back in Genesis 48. It expounds on this a little bit more. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh the eldest and Ephraim the second, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. That's how close to death he was. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. Fun fact, Ephraim means fruitful, and Joseph means shall increase. Their names embody the literal fulfillment of that blessing. I will make you a community of people, and I will give you this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt, before I came to you here, will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. And did you catch that? Because it's easily passed over. Firstly, Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Jacob is adopting Joseph's sons as his own. This effectively gives Joseph a double inheritance because Joseph's first two sons will not split their father's inheritance, but rather each of them receive their own portion directly from their new father and his inheritance. Secondly, Jacob has reversed their names. Remember, Manasseh is the eldest, but Jacob doesn't say Manasseh and Ephraim. He says Ephraim and Manasseh. And as the twelfth of a child of any parent, I'm sure Joseph is probably used to his father mixing up their names. I mean, who isn't? (laughs) Guilty. But Jacob goes on in verse 9. Then Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing. Again, he's a death's door. And because of old age, he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again. And now God has allowed me to see your children too. And there it is, that glimpse that hints at all of that experience that Jacob had lived. Verse 12, Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. 
And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right and Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And then he blessed them. It actually says he blessed Joseph, but it's clearly through them. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. When Joseph saw this, his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. He took his hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's to Manasseh's head and said, No, my father, this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son. He too will become a people, and he too will become a great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And in verse 22, And to you I give one more ridge of land than to your brothers. The ridge I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. And there's way too much here for me to unpack. <laughs> but as a potential tie-in to last week and the story of Jacob and Esau, I like that this additional ridge of land Jacob gives to Joseph is the Hebrew word Shechem. Shechem, meaning shoulder, like a ridge, a mountain ridge. And this same word Shechem also means portion, which could mean like a portion of an inheritance. And according to some Jewish traditions, this was also a play on words and was the actual land of Shechem, capital S. And that is where Joseph's bones are carried when they leave Egypt, and that is where they bury the bones of Joseph. So maybe that tradition has some credence. It can be all of them. And what's interesting about the land of Shechem it's significant as it was both the land where Abraham built an altar after God promised him the promised land, and it was the land where Jacob later built an altar right after confronting his brother Esau, which we heard of in last week's text, when they met up after the betrayal. So this land of Shechem is a place that's marked by dreams and promise, and a place marked by brotherly reconciliation. And it's as if Jacob is saying, to my son, the dreamer, I leave the land of dreams, and I pray that you will live out your life there at peace with your brothers. Beautiful. And then back to our source text, our source verse for today, Hebrews eleven twenty one. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. It's time to pull that pin out. The Hall of Faith moment, the blessings of Ephraim and Manasseh. When the time came for Jacob to pass on the blessing of his fathers to his children, he crosses his hands and places his, his left hand on the eldest and his right hand on the second. And you should be shouting, now wait a second, and not just because that's the title of my sermon, but also because that's not the way of things. That's not how things are done. The eldest is to receive the blessing, by definition, his birthright. The blessing goes to the firstborn. Except, when Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, which one brought the better sacrifice, the first or the second? And, and when Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and then Isaac, which inherited while the other was exiled? The second. <clears throat> And then Isaac goes on and has two sons, Esau and Jacob. 
And uh, which one received the blessing? When Joseph had two sons, while blessing both, which did Jacob bless above the other? So this, this idea may be countercultural, but it's also baked into the sauce of their national identity. <laughs> Woven into the very fibers from the beginning, transferred blessing. And why is that significant? Well, Pete Enns, who's a professor at Eastern University and host of a podcast, The Bible for Normal People, and also the author of books, The Bible Tells Me So, The Sin of Certainty, and How the Bible Actually Works, has studied this much more extensively than I, or I could even probably do. So I'll refer you to a post on his website, an article he's posted there, a podcast that he has on Genesis, and large parts of his first book, specifically chapter three, The Bible Tells Me So, all which explore this in fairly great detail. And I'll post the links to all of those resources in the comments section of this video everywhere that it's posted. But suffice it to say for today, this both aligns with and sets a precedent for Israel's national identity, both from the monarchy of King David, not a firstborn, and Solomon, not a firstborn, to the national identity of Israel itself, who resides in the southern nation of Judah, not a firstborn. And beyond that, the specific examples that were given today of Jacob blessing Ephraim and Manasseh, it isn't just an example of transferred blessing within the Jewish tradition. This is also the crux of Christianity itself. Pun intended. A son was believed to be dead, but is alive, and is found seated at the right hand of Pharaoh, which is the place of the firstborn. And then the blessing. Just as Jacob, Joseph's father, crossed his hand bestowing the birthright on the second, so God, Jesus' father, crosses his hands through the redemptive act of the cross and bestows on us us, the transferred blessing of Jesus. Through the cross, we too are adopted directly into the family of God, to God himself. And we receive the inheritance of Jesus, the firstborn son of God. We are endowed with all the blessings and all the privileges of Jesus as daughters and sons of God. And we receive this eulogy, this blessing, not because of what we've done, but because of who we are, children of God. And God blesses each of us. And God worships, leaning upon the top of that good shepherd's staff. This is our transferred blessing from the God who crosses their arms and chooses to bless us, all of us, and all of us. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you just got to pause. And can we just close our eyes for one moment? And ignore Matt knocking over his. Can we imagine God crossing God's own arms? And bestowing upon each one of us that firstborn identity, that image. Can we say to ourselves in this moment, I belong? I am a firstborn child. There's nothing I lack. This blessing that Jacob bestowed, it was nothing that they did, as Kevin said. It was nothing that they earned. 
It was simply because. Period. Can we drink that in? In a world that demands so much of us. In a world that demands things from us. In a world that demands titles and that we are a certain way, can we drink in that God, because God so loved me, crossed their arms? and said, I give you the firstborn blessing. What a gift. We are not forsaken. We never have been. We are not rejected. We are not left. We are not abandoned. but we are loved and we belong and we are firstborns. My prayer is that we drink that in today and tomorrow and the next day. We don't let that go. I think sometimes we don't spend enough time thinking about that. In the Christian world, we spend so much of our time trying to catch up. We don't have to catch up. We are already there. We live into it. We live into what is already ours. Gotta take a deep breath. Y'all feel colorful now? Sprinkled with all the color? I feel it. A few announcements as we close out our service today. Um, we have an exciting fundraiser for, for the month of April that is kicked off today by our wonderful Brittany and Sandra and their brilliant minds. Um, there's going to be a table out in the great room. We're also going to send this out digitally this week, but we're going to do a calendar raffle. So what that means, this is how it works. So you pick a date on the calendar, you pay for that date. So if you pick April 5th, you'd pay $5. And then you get entered into the raffle five times. So you following me? You good? All right. And then at the, at the end of April, I think we're going to, on Sunday, May 5th, the first Sunday in May, we're going to pick a winner, and there's this awesome raffle basket with some gift cards and some cash and some fun things in there. So this is going to be our fundraiser for April, and it's really simple. Like I said, you can go to the table out in the great room after service the next uh, couple weeks, and we're going to send it out digitally as well, so you can do it online. Um, so that's our awesome fundraiser. Yes? Yes, people online can participate. Um, it's going to go out in our, our weekly newsletter, and um, it'll be on our website as well. Like, the information will be on our website as well. Um, there was one more thing I was going to say. Oh, and multiple people can sign up for dates. So if, like, Matt signed up for April 5th, I could also sign up for April 5th, and so could Mark and Piper. And, you know, so it's not just one person per date. Okay, so I want to make that clear as well. Also, out in the great room after service, um, Val is going to be out there. We have primary elections coming up, and we um, encourage everyone to, to get out and vote, no matter what your political party is. We are a wide, beautiful range of, of people here. And uh, Val has some information um, just about who's on the ballot, who's, who's going to be up. So if you need some information, please see Val out in the great room after service. And finally, we have our new members class today. Woo! 
Ooh, after service out in the um, conference room, we have a beautiful lunch spread. So if you have been visiting with us for a while, maybe you're visiting us for the first time today um, and want to just learn a little bit more about Cornerstone, I encourage you, please go over there. We're going to sit down, have a meal, and um, Pastor Tracy and some of our leaders are going to be there to answer some questions and just talk a little bit more about Cornerstone. So please stay after service for that. That's it. Oh, sacred space. Yes. That is on here, and I just can't read. I'm sorry. Um, we also have sacred space this Tuesday at 7 p.m. in the library. So the third Tuesday of every month, our LGBTQIA plus community meets together. So if you're part of that community, please come out to that at 7 p.m. this Tuesday. Thank you. Please, nobody get offended when I win the raffle. Let's stand for the benediction. <laughs> My prayer today is that we would go and leave in this space and really take this message in. I think so meant much of our journey is grabbing a hold of the fact that we don't play catch up. But that from the beginning, God invites us into this space of completion and belonging. And I feel like so much of our life is spent in a space where we feel like we don't belong or we're less than. And the truth is, is that what Christ did on that cross for us was allow us into this space of completion and return us to what we should have had at the garden. So my prayer is that we would grab a hold of this and that we would so understand that we belong and that we are all of us firstborns. So my prayer for all is that we would grab a hold of that and that we would understand that the blessings that God has poured out are ours already. And that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. And that they are ours simply by the beauty and the love and the grace of God. So I pray all of those blessings upon each one as we go today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.